Welcome back everyone. I've been doing a lot of fantasy reviews lately, but today we're going to be switching it up and we're going to be looking at some Gothic literature. Today we're talking about The Italian by Anne Radcliffe, which was published in 1797. I really enjoyed this one and I'm looking forward to talking about it and comparing it to The Mysteries of Udolfo, which I have already reviewed on this channel. Part 1. Summary. The Italian tells the story of Vivaldi, the son of a noble family, who falls in love with Elena, who is not of noble blood. Vivaldi's parents are against their son's wishes to marry Elena, believing it would degrade the family name, and Vivaldi's ambitious and vindictive mother, the Marchesa, conspires to have Elena sequestered away in a nunnery to stop the marriage. The Marchesa enlists the aid of her confessor, Father Shadoni, who matches her like for like in cruelty and ambition. What follows is a story of religious corruption, kidnap, betrayal, and murder. Part 2. Terror and Horror so I mentioned this in my review of The Mysteries of Udolpho, but I think it's important to make this distinction again between Gothic terror writing and Gothic horror writing. Radcliffe made this distinction herself, partly motivated because there was a style of Gothic, which is the horror style, that was going on at the time, and the Italian is seen as somewhat as a response to this new style of Gothic that was emerging. Terror writing focuses much more on internal fears and the unknown, and often it's more subtle and not so explicit in its depictions of violence, blood and gore, and also the supernatural doesn't tend to feature as much of a presence as it does in horror writing. Horror writing, by contrast, is usually quite explicit, graphic and disturbing, and it's more visual, say, than terror writing. Terror writing is very much internal, and horror writing is much more external. As I've said before, if you were to make a modern comparison between this distinction of terror and horror, your terror gothic would be seen in psychological thrillers, and your horror would be seen in the slasher film genre. The reason why I come back to this distinction again is because the Italian is actually seen as a response to Matthew Gregory Lewis's The Monk, which was a gothic novel at the time that fit more in the horror category and not so much in the terror. Also, great book and definitely worth checking out if you are into gothic literature and you haven't read it. The Monk and the Italian actually do have a lot of similarities. Both of them are heavily criticising religion, and both of them feature a monk as the central villain of the piece. What's different though between the two is that Radcliffe tells her story as a story of terror, it's more about psychological horror, less explicit, and in Lewis's The Monk it's all about that very visual horror and it involves things like the devil and these supernatural creatures that aren't present in Radcliffe's work. Now I think both of these novels are great and they both stand as pinnacles of these two styles of writing. For me the Italian stands as Radcliffe's like the peak of Radcliffe are her powers in terms of this terror style. One of the problems that I had with The Mysteries of Udolpho was that while you do get about half of the book really tense, it's really dark, a lot of the book, it's a very long book and it's quite meandering. The Italian is better than Udolpho for me because its shorter length means that she's able to keep the tension more consistently throughout, whereas in Mysteries of Udolpho you'll have whole volumes or passages dedicated to describing beautiful scenery and that can kind of kill the mood a bit. Whereas because the Italian is shorter, the whole thing is just consistently brooding and dark and there's always the threat of danger coming on the next page. So for me, in terms of capturing this terror style of writing, keeping you, you know, things tense, this book just does it so well. And again, to compare it to The Monk, which I do really like The Monk, I think it's a great book, but to compare it to that, it's amazing how well Radcliffe is able to keep, you, keep things tense and keep you in fear without resorting to explicit depictions of violence or, you know, supernatural creatures or anything like that. In fact, one of the scenes that I think is the most tense in the book is when Elena has been captured by the monk and she's in this room, she's locked there for a while, and she's just sat as a prisoner and her mind's wandering, and someone keeps approaching the door and then leaving. And the way she describes the feet kind of just outside and someone's whispering and she can't quite hear what they're saying, and then they go away and then they come back and every time they do this she's thinking are they coming to kill me are they coming to check to see if i'm dead already like it's so tense and nothing's happening really except for this person is just walking back and forth in the corridor it's such a good scene it's really tense and there's also a bit of that where the narrator sort of breaks the fourth wall a bit to let the reader know that this door on this lock has a mechanism that allows you to come in very quietly and murder someone while they're sleeping and eleanor doesn't know this obviously and just that, that line, it, oh, just sends, sends shivers down my spine, uh, that whole scene. It's really good, it's really tense, and again, it's not particularly graphic or gory, it's just the tension of being captive, and the paranoia and the fear that sets in, and she captures that really well. 
So overall, I do think that the Italian stands as a peak of terror gothic of that style. I think it's much better done this time than it was in Udolfo, because it's shorter, it's more focused, and just some of the descriptions and, and scenes are just... <laughs> have to read it for yourself because I don't want to spoil them, but they're really good. Part three, human villainy. So there are two men... So there are two main villains in The Italian. We have Father Shidoni, the monk, and we have Vivaldi's mother, the Marchesa. And both of these villains are just perfect gothic villains. Again, to make comparisons with other texts, in The Mysteries of Rodolfo, the villain, uh, Montoni, he's good, but he's just kind of evil. He's just a terrible tyrant. That's kind of it. What I like about the two villains in this book is that they are terrible, horrible people, but they also have a veil or a little little spark of humanity inside them. And it's nice when you get little scenes where this gets revealed to you as a reader because you don't ever you don't ever feel bad for the villains in the story, but you do come you do feel for them. You can empathize with them in some moments, even if ultimately they're still horrible, so you don't like them. And I think that's a perfect villain. A villain that you can relate to because they're a human being, but at the end they're still horrible, uh, which for me is a perfect villain. I actually think the villains are probably the best part of this book, and the scenes between Father Shadoni and the Marchesa are some of the best scenes in the entire book. I'm actually going to read one out because I just think it's, it's really good. So the two of them are talking to each other, and this is when they're deciding what to do about Elena and Vivaldi's relationship. And both of them, in the back of their minds, they, they want to just kill Elena. They just, they, they just want to get rid of her. But neither of them have the goal to actually say it out loud. So they're both trying to suggest it in little subtle ways. And they want the other person to be the one that says, yes, we're going we're gonna to kill them. So that they can kind of take some of the moral blame. And it just goes back and forth like this for a while. And it was just, it's, really good, it's a really good dialogue scene. And it's also just really funny because, again... They're both horrible people, but they're also cowards. They're not really willing to be the one that, you know, explicitly says, we're going to kill this person. So I'm going to read this out because I just think it's a great passage. The Marchesa wished him to lead her back to the point from which she herself had deviated, and he seemed determined that she should lead him thither. She mused and hesitated. Her mind was not yet familiar with atrocious guilt, and the crime which Shadoni had suggested somewhat alarmed her. She feared to think, and still more to name it. Yet, so acutely susceptible was her pride, so stern her indignation, and so profound her desire of vengeance, that her mind was tossed on a tempestuous ocean, and these terrible feelings threatened to overwhelm all the residue of humanity in her heart. Shadoni observed all its progressive movements and, like a gaunt tiger, lurked in silence, ready to spring forward at the moment of opportunity. It is your advice then, father, resumed the Marchesa, after a long pause, it is your opinion that Eleanor, she hesitated, Zyrus that Shadoni should anticipate her meaning, but he chose to spare his own delicacy rather than that of the Marchesa. You think, then, that this insidious girl deserves? She paused again, but the confessor, still silent, seemed to wait with submission for what the Marchesa should deliver. I repeat, father, that it is your opinion this girl deserves severe punishment. Undoubtedly, replied Shadoni. Is it not also your own? That not any punishment can be too severe, continued the Marchesa, that justice, equally with necessity, demands her life? Is this not your opinion too? Oh, pardon me, said Shidoni. I may have erred. That only was my opinion, and when I formed it, I was probably too much under the influence of zeal to be just. When the heart is warm, how is it possible that the judgment can be cool? It is not, then, your opinion, Holy Father, said the Marchesa, with displeasure. I do not absolutely say that, replied the Confessor, but I leave it to your better judgment to decide upon its justness. As he said this, he rose to depart. The Marchesa was agitated and perplexed, and requested he would stay, but he excused himself by alleging that it was the hour when he must attend a regular Mass. So that's the scene, and I love it. I just like that back and forth where he's suggested that the murder takes place prior to that discussion. And then she's sort of saying, you know, are you, are you sure that's... And she doesn't actually say it outright. She wants him to confirm what he said. And then when she... And he just kind of backtracks all the time until she's the one that says it. And then he goes, ooh, I don't know about that. And I just... It's so good. It's so manipulative. And it just shows how horrible these two are. It's just such a good scene. 
Another thing that I really like about The Italian is its connection to Shakespeare and in particular the character of Lady Macbeth. And I see there are many parallels between Lady Macbeth and the Marchesa especially, but also Shadoni. Now, for those of you that have read Macbeth, you'll know that in Lady Macbeth's big monologue, she talks about she doesn't want to, she doesn't want to be a woman. She wants to expel her femininity because that's seen as you know weak, a woman's heart, that kind of thing. And the Marchesa is described in, in this very scene prior to that discussion as being incredibly manly. I think she says she has a man's courage and she doesn't like her feminine aspects. So she's very much doing this Lady Macbeth thing. And then when they actually acknowledge that they're going to murder someone, she feels bad about it for a couple of seconds. And she only bullies her about this. And I think internally in his head he thinks, oh, this is, you know, even this woman, she's still weak-hearted because she's a woman. And then later on something happens that I won't spoil. But Shidoni is in a situation where he has to do a terrible thing. And he does the same faltering. He, his you know, masculine courage leaves him. And I think it's a great subversion of that idea that, you know, women have feeble hearts. Because it turns out that even the guy, even the male villain, he also can't, you know, put his words where his mouth is. And it's great. It's a nice little subversion of the, you know, that idea that women are weak and men are strong. Because both of the villains have a lot of courage and they want to do terrible things. But the minute it actually comes to enacting those things out, they doubt themselves. They're able to feel guilt. And I just love that. I love that connection to Lady Macbeth and also the subversion of that. It's really good. Part four, the protagonist. So we've talked about the villains. Now let's talk about the protagonists. I didn't like the protagonists in this book as much as I liked the protagonists in The Mysteries of Rodolfo. In The Mysteries of Rodolfo, you have a relationship between Emily and Valancourt, and their relationship I really enjoyed. And the relationship between Eleanor and Vivaldi in this one, which is the, you know, it's the instigating thing for a lot of the action, I didn't really sell all that well to me. They kind of just see each other, and it's a love at first sight thing, and they don't really have that much time to develop a relationship before things start going crazy. And so, it didn't strike me as, as convincing as it was with Udolfo, where Valancourt and Emily have a pretty, they have a long time to get to know each other, and then the stuff in the story happens, and then they have a whole last volume that deals exclusively with their relationship and its problems. So you really felt like their relationship was tangible and real and made sense. I didn't feel that as much with the Italian. In fact, in the early part of the book, I actually found Vivaldi's pursuit of Eleanor um, kind of annoying. He's just a bit like a puppy that won't go away, um, and he's just constantly begging her to see him and blah de blah and it's just a bit, I don't know, it's not quite stalker levels, but it is a bit annoying, um, and yeah, I mean, one good thing is that Eleanor does hold her own against him, um, they're both, like, individually they're actually quite good, um, but yeah, their relationship, a bit annoying, it's not so bad as like, the novel progresses, I do think at the end it, it's not too bad, but the way their relationship was set up, given that this is the you know this is the thing that causes the Marchesa and Shadoni to enact the terrible plans, I would have liked a more realistic build-up of the romance there. So I wasn't all wowed by the central relationship between those two. In fact, I would say that the mysteries of Adolfo is very much Emily's story. She is the gothic heroine. It's about her, and we're following her, and that's why most of the thing like most of the horror in that book is in the second and third volumes, and the other two volumes are just her personal life almost. And in this book, it seems like the, the main focus is actually on the, the monk and the Marchesa, the evil people who are doing the terrible things, rather than the people who the terrible things are being done to. So it just makes sense that they're going to get a little bit, little bit less time than Emily got in Adolfo. Luckily though, the characters, the, the other good characters in the book, are actually really interesting and fun. So we have Olivia, who is a nun who Eleanor meets when she is taken to the nunnery, and she's a great character. She is mysterious, you don't quite know why she is being so friendly towards Elena, and slowly you find out as, as the novel progresses what's going on with her, and that was really well done. It was a really nice twist. It was... I really liked her character. Another fun character is Paolo, who is um, Vivaldi's manservant, who <laughs> I personally think probably has a bit of a gay crush on Vivaldi, because he spends most of the novel confessing his undying devotion for his master in a very dramatic, over-the-top way, which, I don't know, it just seems like he's probably got a crush on him and it's very amusing to watch. Probably not what Radcliffe was going for, but as a modern reader, when someone is literally kissing someone's feet <laughs> and crying over them, it just... Oh dear. Hilarious. Hilarious. Unintentionally hilarious, maybe, but a good character all the same. 
But overall, yeah, I did think that the central protagonist's not as good as Udolpho. I do think if we got the protagonists of the Mysteries of Udolpho, so Emily and Valancourt, and we shoved those into the Italian where we have the best gothic villains, the monk and the Marchesa, you just get a perfect gothic novel right there because you've got great protagonists and a great villain. Whereas, unfortunately, the protagonists in this one, not so great, but also not terrible. Part four, what a coincidence. So one last thing to talk about before we wrap up, and that is the plot itself. So there are lots of elements of the plot which rely on coincidence and those kinds of things, and I think these might be things that would annoy a modern reader. Now, I don't particularly mind this because I actually think that the value of the Italian is more about tension and horror and the relationships between the characters and the, more those things than the actual plot itself. However, it may be annoying when you get to the end of the book and there are these twists and you think about these twists and you're like, wait a minute, that is incredibly coincidental and not realistic at all. So that might be something that you might find irritating as a reader. One thing that I would say about this is, yes, that is a weakness of the books, but it's not really where the, you know, the meat of the text is anyway. It's really in those gothic villains and the tension created throughout. So it's a small gripe that I have and it's one that I think readers may also have. So bear that in mind when you're reading it, that the, the plot, some of the little reveals, it's just like, really, would that have happened? Is that realistic? But I don't think it's overall a particularly bad thing about the book. Part six, conclusion. So overall, I think this is possibly one of the best Gothic novels that I've read. It's certainly Anne Radcliffe's best that I've read so far, and I'm looking forward, so I've read this and Udolpho, I'm looking forward to reading more of her stuff and reviewing them on the channel as well and seeing how if my opinion remains true to the end. But yeah, I thought this was a great book. The villains are just up there with gothic villains for me. Evil, terrible, but at the same time human. Perfect. The tension and atmosphere of the book is way more effective than I thought it was in Udolpho. Radcliffe still retains her great power to describe beautiful scenery and characters and their internal psychologies. It's really impressive how well written this book is, especially because I have always found with older texts that they tend to be more, tend to be less good at developing convincing psycho psychologies. Um, and that might just be because it's harder to relate to someone who's from a very different time. So maybe it's to do with that. But I just think Radcliffe, regardless of the time difference, the characters that she has, their motivations, their psychologies are convincing and just really good. Small gripes would be the protagonists are not my favorite and the plot coincidences at the end are a little bit annoying. But aside from that, just a great novel and definitely worth reading. All right, that's it for today's video. Please let me know in the comments what you think of The Italian if you've read it, and what you think of Radcliffe's work in general if, you've, if you're if you wider read with her stuff. Really look forward to discussing that with you all. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to subscribe to my channel for updates for new videos. I post videos every week on Mondays. All right, that's it for me, so take care everyone, and I'll see you all next time.